be engaged by the film, hopefully. Um, but when I was listening to, um, sorry, I'm really bad with names, but I was listening to the um, some of the speakers, and I was thinking about how in 1982, 81, 82, I was doing research for the first uh, public television documentary on the history of gay and lesbian community in America. And at that time, it was re like pulling teeth to get older gay people to talk to me because they were terrified. They were still in the mindset they're going to lose their job, their grandchildren are going to ice them. You know, the, the, everything that I've heard a lot about atheists talking about coming out here was from the early 80s. And one of the women, who was a very important a uh, woman who had founded a very early press to publish uh, lesbian novels called Nyad Press, said to me, you know, this was in 1983, I don't think I will ever, that in my lifetime, we will ever see gay equality. And I thought, and l unfortunately she passed away bef a few years ago. And I thought, oh, Barbara, it's, when I was sitting here, I said, it's, it's, more exciting than that. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I listened to a straight middle-aged man talk about, dressed in a fig leaf, talk only, <laughs> nude, talking about how you, we have to look to gay people as leaders to free ourselves as atheists with our sexuality. And I think Barbara rolled over in her grave when, you know, she heard that. So we are kind of all connected, not with religion, but with, you know, the molecules. And I just thought I'd tell that story because I just kind of, it was just my little musings because the film has a lot of my musings in it. It's two stories interwoven. One is my own experience with um, and talking to my classmates with being in a graduate level biology class in New York City and discovering my biology professor was a uh, creationist. I went back to school in midlife. So that kind of startled me. And then, um, and then the other story is uh, where I went with the Eugenie Scott and her merry band of troubadours exploring whether the Grand Canyon was formed by the Noah's Flood or by geological forces. So I'll leave that to you guys to ponder, which it was, uh, as you watch the movie. Um, and I hope, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions and discussion because uh, the very engaged audience. All right, enjoy. If you thought that your child's science teacher didn't accept the theory of evolution, what would you think about that? I wouldn't think they should teach the subject. The Bible says that God made everything in six days, and on day six he made the land animals and he made Adam and Eve. And so if God made land animals on day six, guess what? I'm going to stand up in the culture and authoritatively say, dinosaurs live with people. No, they actually didn't. Uh because dinosaurs were extinct way before humans originated. I'm very upfront with my students. I say, you know, I teach science, and in science you link observations to evidence. So um, when I teach evolution, I tell them sort of flat out that a creationist perspective is not science. Without that idea of common ancestry, you really are, are missing the, the big net of ideas that holds biology together. creation science, interpretation of Grand Canyon, has it being laid, all 4,000 feet of it being laid down by Noah's flood. This is a key example for the creation science people of their point of view. 
A strategy of creationists is to manufacture controversy and use this to try and impose their creationism into public schools. Uh, my feeling is that we need to teach all of them intelligent design as well as Darwinism, you know, without having to shut the kids from the, the, determining which one they want to take. I don't understand how you can be smart enough to feed yourself and not believe in evolution. I mean, that just is so basic to everything, every aspect of life. All you have to do is look around you. I mean, you know, it's just the, the dynamic Earth. Nothing is fixed in stone. I mean, evolution is so basic that I do not understand how you can call yourself a biologist and not believe it. like we've gone into a controversy that didn't exist when I grew up, or at least where I grew up, and so I don't understand it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, in, well, for one thing, when um, you were lucky that you were in a good school district that had biology that was probably required. But basically, it wasn't really until Sputnik and the, the race with the Russians to, um, you know, the space race, that um, that American public schools started to really include science and in all was started to be part of, you know, curriculums in a, in a broad way. And, of course, once it was introduced in school districts across the country, people, the re, you know, religious people started to object to it being there. So before it was, so it just wasn't, you were just really in a really lucky school district. But it's very interesting. The other thing is certainly in urban districts, for example, this guy is not obviously Nigerian. What happened is that they have such a hard time keeping, uh, getting teachers, especially science teachers, the crisis in the training and, and retaining, that they recruit from wherever they can, wherever they can come and, from. And so, actually, after I made this film, I found an, out about a number of Nigeria, in particular, is a source for New York City public school high school teachers of science, and they actually know that many of them are creationists, but they need body, warm bodies to teach. So it's a crisis in terms of recruiting and retaining teachers. I think the statistics on, from the National Center for Science Education are that. Uh, I, st I mean, oh, I can't, I can't remember, I should have written this down, but you can go on their website and find out, but over half of biology teachers in America do not teach evolution at all because they just don't want to be, uh, they just don't want the blowback. So they just don't do it, which is crazy because as one of the high school teachers says, that means you can't teach science because <laughs> it's, it's the backbone of everything. Yeah, and then the rise of the evangelicals as a as a as a as a political and social movement instead of just, you know, a religious thing. Yeah. Yeah. They came down to the city. He said they used to be just in the hills, the evangelicals. Yeah. Are you Zach? Welcome. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, oh, okay. So okay. the numbers are 60% of public school teachers don't teach evolution, and another 13% teach creationism outright. So that leaves 27% of teachers who actually teach evolution properly. K-12. Well, they usually don't teach it until high school. Well, my daughter's school, which is like, which is where I filmed those kids uh, in the class with my classmate Rob, it just all sort of came together. Uh, he is that's in six, those are sixth graders talking about science and in the Museum of Natural History. So, you know, th and those are just regular urban city kids who just have a really good teacher. The professor from Nigeria, the professor from Nigeria had a PhD. Oh, yes, that's a great tragedy. Where, where, um, where, where? where <laughs> 
Where did he go to school? Okay, this is the thing. This is we. Were, so one of the people, well, somebody was talking earlier about like which is like this liberal snake in the grass tolerance versus just hardline fundamentalist. And Femi, my former professor, um, was a was a getting er, earning his PhD in urban science education with a guy. Uh, who had, you know, has this theory of like the kids, you know, decide, let the kids sort of teach themselves kind of thing. It's like a liberal kind of philosophy. It's not inquiry learning, it's more obscure, shall we say, than that. And um, that's why he was saying that ki we should teach them both and then the kids can figure it out. That's where, it, but that's a muddled, muddled thinking of what the theory is, of course, obviously. But after I exposed him, um, what happened was the liberal, the union, defended his right on religious grounds because it became, and that's why in the film, the way I had the different teachers I interviewed, everybody had slightly different opinions because nobody from the university ever came in and clarified it to the class because he said, I'm going to sue you for racism. And they didn't, they didn't want it, so they swept it under the rug. He went on to earn his PhD, and now he's been sent to uh, South Africa. So we sent, you know, a creationist to South Africa to teach science education. What? So he's on some kind of National Science Foundation thing, and um, and it was interesting because at the at the New York Academy of Science screening last year. Uh, Afterwards, I was having drinks with some of the people from there, and one of the guys said, oh, yeah, I know Femi, but, you know, he's just his, it's just his belief system. I mean, it doesn't really affect his teaching. I was like, you're, you're on the education committee of the New York Academy of Sciences? That's this liberal idea of tolerance or, you know, like, just kind of, it, it was weird. It's weird. It's weird. I don't get it. So did City College actually fire him, or he did he? He was an adjunct, so he wasn't rehired. But CUNY is a system that has 20 universities in it. So he just went and taught at a different one. Hey, Greta. Hi. Um, one of the issues that I was thinking about recently, um, there was, a, I guess, a lawsuit filed in uh, Kansas regarding, this was filed by creationists, purported, or, and as I understand it. And the lawsuit, part of the content of the argument as I understand it, was that some of the content of evolution would not be age appropriate. Uh, in other words, they were the, the attempt was to teach evolution at a very early age, and that part of their argument was this may not be the time to do it, and you need to teach it at a, at a different timing, so to speak. And I got to thinking about that in a lot of different contexts for myself. And I remember having some really silly notions about how evolution worked, even though I was taught it, uh, you know, and, and taught biology and science in a, in, a, in a California school and then later in a Texas school. Um, is the, do, we, have we, do we have a really good mechanism and methodology for teaching it and answering that kind of uh, accusation from people who were trying to push a 5,000-year-old Earth notion, which doesn't explain how we get oil out of the ground, for instance. Well, I mean, I again, I would just say, like, teachers like, like Rob or, and Barbara in the film who teach sixth-grade kids evolution, and they get it, and they can tell us more than Ken Ham can, then obviously there, there are ways to do it. Um, and and uh, what he does really is into he into integrates it into everything, whatever the science is. I mean, you know, science education is a huge academic field in terms of, of how to teach it. But I think a lot of those kind of, fr what I, those are frivolous lawsuits. Those are like, we just want to find, we're just going to take, like, science is this giant thing, and we're just going to take little needles and, 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 and prick all around it. I mean, that's, that's what I think. I'm not sure they'd call it frivolous. I think it would be probably in, inappropriate, and considering politics of a place like Kansas, incredibly stupid of us to dismiss it that way. 
And that's why I brought it up, because mm -hmm. to me, part of the response needs to include um, a very methodical approach of saying, okay, we know what evolution is, and this is exactly what it is. It does not mean, to get down the weeds a little bit, it does not mean that if I go out and shoot in, in, during hunting season all the deer with antlers, that from here on out we will have antlerless deer. It may mean we just have no more deer, okay? And so... We, I feel like that's the kind of weed level stuff that isn't getting done. We stand up here in our ivory towers because we understand what evolution mm -hmm. is, and we poo-poo people who haven't done the groundwork. And I think to a certain degree we have an obligation to make sure that there's no confusion whatsoever regarding what evolution is and what we're going to teach at every single stage and make sure dead certain that we're not messing up on our side so that when they come at us with you know, what we purport to be frivolous lawsuits, we can defend those like it was done up in Dover. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean frivolous. As, I, didn't, I meant frivolous and it's, it's, they know that they, there is no proof for it. You know, there's, no, there's no scientific evidence against evolution. That's what I meant by frivolous. But, I mean, the thing is that um, it's interesting because, like, the sort of um, policy – strategy, uh, political strategy of like the National Center for Science Education. They'll say education isn't, it's not about education because it's social political. You can't, edu you can't prove, you can't provide proof for the evolution and then they'll go, oh, all right then, I, I accept the evidence because that's not how the thinking works. Which is different than what, um, oh God, the guy from Austin, the last speaker today, then it's blurring the name. So anyway, what he was saying was just, he was saying, no, we have to talk to them because there are cracks in the armor and we do have the evidence and there are a lot of individuals who can be convinced. So it's a little bit of a different strategy in the, uh, within the people who, you know, accept evolution as to how you approach uh, ind individuals. But, I mean, another thing that I tried to do in the film was that uh, some people have said, oh, he's such an obvious target. I said... Well, he is because that's how I structured the film. But you can be sure that when they called him, when he said you can learn it one way to pass the test, that's exactly what he did. He learned it really well. So when he was called in before his, you know, whoever was judging him as an academic, he kn knew all the right rhetoric and all the right language. You saw where he changed his language from one part of the interview to the next. Um, and that's what they do. I have a hunch that this guy actually once I outed him and went to the administration and was like, this is like the loony bin. Lo the bin is being, the, the asylum is being run by the inmates here. Um, and he, um, and somewhere in there he got, he went to some legal group or somebody advised him of the la changes language. So it's a s belief system. It's intelligent design. Because that's not as all. And that's what they, that's that's one way how they get away with it. The strategies. Oh, a Common Core. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm sorry. When I was uh, the Common Core does common the common co one thing is one reason we have more of a problem here than in other countries is because all the rest of the world have common curriculum uh, set on a national level and it's run by people who actually know something about the subjects that's setting their curriculum, whereas we have individual school boards that people are elected to, and they have the, and then they can make the, um, then they can, you know, put forward their own curriculum and, and whatever that's, and, and, and change the rules and decide what they're going to teach them. And you, Zach, could probably talk a lot about, like, text, why Texas is so important, because they make the textbooks. But um, that's another way. Because we have like a million school boards, and and everywhere else in the Western world, they have Common Core, they have Common Curriculum. In fourth grade, this is what kids need to know, and this is it's based on actual academic criteria. But the, our Common Core does address it, and there's a few states that are not wanting to be in the Common Core because it includes evolution. At what age? At what, what age? Yeah. I don't know. Do you know? What age does the Common Core address evolution? So evolution is normally 7th, ninth, 10th grade, as far as I'm aware. And I know that can change state by state. 
Um, I think the interesting thing on Common Core is actually, if you all have seen what's happening in Kentucky, where Common Core is apparently the evil, fascist, um, elitist, rich man's religion of evolution, and that therefore shouldn't be taught and is going to cause lots of problems. That's what the creationists there have been saying. Um, and um, the good news on Common Core is it actually prevents things like Texas having a monopoly of, over the textbooks. Because right now, Texas has 10% of the students in the country. And so when Texas makes a textbook, states around the country end up using that textbook because publishers don't create new books. But suddenly, if Common Core is adopted in 40 states around the country, then there'll be essentially a block of maybe 80% of the students in the country that's much larger than Texas is 10%. I, I was wondering about electronic books and maybe that, you know, the Texas monop to that Texas book publisher companies won't have the monopoly so much if things get a little bit more electronic and then schools around the nation also have a choice of which books to choose to buy and so maybe it won't be as much of an issue? I mean, beca because um, electronic, well, I think electronic books for textbooks are still pretty much controlled by the same they take the same amount of work for the researches, the writing, the testing, the curriculum development, and all of that. So, mm. you know, I'm not sure. I, well, we don't know. I mean, the digital age is going to shift everything. But I don't know about it in that regard. I mean, actually, the digital age is actually, I think, there was a session on it today. I missed it. Uh, not directly addressing evolution, but about how... Because of this, what I call the Apple Mac approach to life, which is everything's equal. You just push a button, you just go and you just Google something, and and if you Google creation, creation versus evolution, you're going to get 20 creationist sites, and you know two evolution sites. But there's no differentiation. There's no you know a th there's no expert who's e the editor who tells you which is valid and which isn't. So every person has to individually do that research and figure it out, which is, you know, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's harder, yeah. I, I have a question. Um, to me, it's a clear issue. It's a religious agenda, and we don't have prayer in schools because that has been um, settled in court. I don't understand how this cannot be... Um, a legal battle that's settled easily. It, it is. Every time, well, this is a really good point. Every time it goes to court, they lose since Scope, which was, they, they, which Scope's was uh, Tennessee monkey trial in the 30s, in which they, the science teacher tried to teach evolution was, you know, was not allowed to teach evolution. He lost the case. But ever since then, Every legal case comes down on the side of teaching evolution. Um, the latest big one was Dover, which was uh, very important in terms of legal precedent. But as we know, if you're a religious fanatic, you don't care about secular law. You just care about what you think and what you want what, 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 how you want to live. So it's just a lot of it is not like the school board says, okay, we are going to officially allow people to teach Believe me, the science department at City College did not think that Femi uh, was going to not teach evolution or was going to talk that crazy crap that he was talking. However, um, he just did it. And then it becomes up to one individual, in this case me, who says, uh, hello. And then everybody else kind of, uh, most of the students joined in. But the administration didn't want to deal with it, even though the the science department was like totally flipping out. He was completely ostracized. But you know, it's just it becomes political or social. But legally, it's it's kind of, well, it's like desegregation. We've had desegregation on the laws of the country for since Little Rock, and uh, we have a lot of racism and segregation in our schools still. You know. So I think that's why. I mean, it seems really obvious, and it is obvious, but it doesn't stop. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, you sort of addressed part of my question, but it seems to me that Fem Femi, is that his name? Yeah. Femi was arguing from a, a separate magisteria. In other words, I can separate my religious beliefs, and I can teach science, and I think there have been... Did Stephen Jay 
Gould kind of support this in a way or something? I, I know Dawkins wrote about it in The God Delusion, and I think he brought up Stephen Jay Gould. Well, Mine have supported that. Yeah. But my question is, um, and you kind of answered that, because why didn't it matter to the administration that he was not willing to teach the subject and you see why did your classmates not all stand behind you i guess well because so all my classmates didn't all stand behind me because some of them were creationists and they were teaching science and they and what happened was it was a special program i was the only one who wasn't already a science teacher well they were already teaching science and they and the mayor said okay to continue teaching in new york city public schools you have to earn a master's degree so they were all getting their tuition paid by the state to, 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 to get a master's degree. And they just, this administration did not want to go into a long, drawn out legal battle with the union supporting him and the, um, and the, uh, um, and the, uh, and, and they were worried that about their state funding for this master's program where they were supposed to be raising the level. And, you know, they just wanted to brush it under the rug. You know how they, that happens. Well, maybe you don't. Probably you're probably more li live in a more ethical world, but it happens a lot on a lot of things. We have time for one more question. What made you want to make this movie? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I made a lot of movies on a lot of different subjects, and I was going to not make movies anymore. I went back to school to get my master's, and then I stumbled on Femi in the classroom, and I kept, and I tried to fight it through the channels of the administration. I went and I was like, I mean, half the half the people just dropped the class, um, and they were just basically like, he was sitting in the movie. He's we're in a class and we're having a discussion. Those little animated dinosaurs are verbatim. I like. I was so flipping out. I just started writing down everything someone said to keep myself from, you know, saying something I would regret. So I wrote down everything that the, was said in the classroom. But what? Verbatim. Yeah, the verbatim. Yeah. So what happened was, um, we were, you know, what is evolution? I'm not. I mean, what? What is life? So we started that discussion. Then he literally turned to the board and he drew those those four, you know, representations of the embryo, and he said, those people who believe this, those people who believe this are propagandists for evolution. Those are the exact words. And a couple of people, one person was like, what did you say? Like, excuse me? And what do you, you know, and it started this classroom discussion. This guy had like, um, I knew he was kind of off because he, when he would turn on his computer, he had a biblical quote on the screen before he would start his lectures in class. So I knew it was kind of weird. So, but that's how, I be, that's how I found out that he actually really was. And that's the thing. Okay, he might know about some of the mechanism about evolution. He was definitely in that classroom to teach that it was okay to be a creationist. That was no doubt about it in my mind. So then I was like, okay, I am a filmmaker. I have the skills to tell this story to the world because people usually because he's they're very slippery these creations they're not always just overt I think they're more overt in the south than they are in the north uh, and um, from what I can tell from being here from hearing listening to everybody um, but uh, so that's why I made so then I just said well okay that's what I do I make movies so I have to make a movie about it and then I get then I heard about the um, the Grand Canyon raft trip. And I was like, well, that would be really visually stunning. And that's such a, to us who accept what science is, it is so obvious that the Grand Canyon is geological formation that I thought it would be an interesting little visual way to tell, to explore some issues. Huh? Jeannie? She's, yeah, she's still there, but she's about to retire. All right, well, let's give right, it up for you. Greta Schiller. How long did it take to bring it all together, Greta? Um, well, first, first I went out and I, I, once I realized I wanted to make a movie, I went and interviewed my fellow classmates to, get a, to find out if I um, remembered things the way I thought I remembered them. And I did. Like, everybody 
played their role exactly. The ones who supported me in Argon in class did so on the interviews. And then the people like Shelly who were a little, well, you were kind of out there. I think she thought I was racist. And then we laughed so much about that afterwards. But um, she was a little, she thought, you know, uh, that, that, you know, he had a right to his opinion and I was being like over the top. So uh, after I interviewed them, I decide then I so that was I don't know so I mean probably from when I interviewed them to the fin to the ending of the edit mm, two years two and a half years something like that. Yeah, you can by the way if you're interested you can buy the the DVDs on my website or I have I think I have a few left here. Uh, I, my um nodinals.com and also you can watch it online so if you're at you know hanging out with people over Christmas and they want to like sing Christmas girls you can say let's go in the den and watch a good movie <laughs>